Okay, so you already saw the title of this video, you know what this is responding to, so let's just get to it because this is going to be very long. So first, Sarah talks about why she has disabled comments on this video. Uh, she says that she had two other videos on veganism up on her channel that she has since deleted, and those videos allowed comments, and there were comments, really horrible comments from vegans, you know, uh, wishing death upon her and her unborn child. Now, I didn't watch those videos when they were up, I didn't see any of the comments, but I have no reason not to believe Sarah, like we've all seen vegans do this. We've all seen comments like this on similar videos, you know, videos where someone is saying that they're not vegan or they're no longer vegan. We've all seen this type of thing. I've experienced this type of thing just for like not being the right kind of vegan. It's awful and there's no excuse for it. This is not non-vegans that we're talking to be. This was the full-on vegan community. I don't want to be a part of it. I really, really don't. I've completely lost a lot of respect for a lot of vegans. So unfortunately, this is something I hear about fairly frequently, people not wanting to uh, be vegan, uh, like eat a vegan diet or, or be associated with veganism because of honestly a sizable portion of like vegan YouTubers. I even hear from people who are vegan who now don't call themselves vegan anymore, again, because they don't want to be associated with vegans. And I can't really blame them. I mean, look, <laughs> it's pretty obvious if you've watched any of the videos on my channel that I have very little to no respect for a lot of vegan YouTubers. But clearly there is a difference between not calling yourself vegan because vegans suck and not being vegan because vegans suck. Veganism isn't about vegans. It's about reducing harm to others. It's about the innocent creatures who suffer and die needlessly in animal agriculture. And it's about human beings who suffer the environmental consequences of our actions because of our choice to consume animals. You don't have to be part of the vegan community to be vegan. I'm vegan. I have a vegan channel. I don't consider myself part of the vegan community, either online or like in person locally where I live. In my personal everyday life, vegan just plays a, a small role, honestly. Like my family and I, we don't we don't seek out other vegans to associate with. We don't go to vegan meetups. We don't go to vegan festivals or anything like that. We eat a vegan diet. We don't wear fur, leather, etc. That's pretty much it. So then Sarah talks about, uh, I think she says a couple years ago, watching some vegan documentaries and learning about the meat industry, which ultimately inspired her to try and find quote unquote, ethically, sustainably sourced meat. Which led me to a local farm market. Everything they do is very natural when it comes to their animals. Their animals live outside, their animals have full lives. They don't do anything such as separating the mama cow from the baby cow or anything like that. Like they let these animals live as normal lives as possible. It's great that she was so affected by this information that she actually sought to do better and make better choices. You know, there's a good chance that these animals do live better lives. However, when a profit motive is involved, you just cannot trust advertisement. I'm sure she has talked to these farmers and I'm sure they told her everything that she wanted to hear. And look, I'm sure they probably believe it themselves, but it's hard to deny that there are a lot of biases at play. Commodifying sentient beings turns them into a product and the goal of any product is to make money. The temptation to cut corners, thereby making even more money is just too great. And it's why we see this happen over and over and over again. I talked about the supposedly ethical turkey farm that was exposed as being anything but. I also talked about the hospice that was literally murdering people for profit. The people who do these things aren't just evil. They're not just cartoon villains, right? They are normal people living normal lives. They have family members who love them. They're flawed human beings who are financially motivated to do evil things. So on average, do these animals live better lives than the animals on factory farms? Yeah, probably. But are they totally 100% free from abuse and suffering? Do none of them slip through the cracks? That is totally implausible. Farms are not charities, they are not animal sanctuaries, they are businesses, and neglect is often cheaper than care. What happens when an animal is sick or injured and treatment costs more than the market weight is going to be worth? What about when even euthanizing that animal costs more than just leaving her neglected and letting her die slowly in pain? What about when an antibiotic-free animal gets an infection and needs antibiotics to save her from an agonizing death? There are so many questions like these, dozens of questions like these that you wouldn't even know to ask 
without knowing the industry. So I'm not buying as much meat because it is more expensive. Therefore, I'm really reducing the amount of meat that I have like really start intaking as well as my entire family. That's awesome. Reduced consumption is an important part of reducing harm, both in terms of animal cruelty and the environment. If meat being more expensive is helping people to eat less of it, that's awesome but it's ultimately the reduction that's doing the most good, not the production process itself. Also, the environment really suffers from factory farming and unsustainable farming. I think it's like 51 or 52% of the whole world's like greenhouse gas emissions is from factory farming. Animal agriculture emissions are not from factory farming specifically, they are from animal agriculture period. The environmental effects are actually worse from these free-range, grass-fed, pasture-raised, whatever you want to call them, animals. Not only do they require more space, but they eat more. They have lower feed conversion ratios, and they produce more methane, particularly cows. So there's a good chance that someone like Sarah is actually doing worse for the environment by switching to these so-called sustainable operations, unless she is eating so much less meat that she is actually like offsetting the damage, right? I mean, it would depend on how much less meat she's actually eating. But she says later in the video that she's actually starting to eat more of this sustainable meat. So yeah, there's a good chance that she's doing more harm. With local farming, literally, the farm market that I do it with is very small. Again, all the animals, very healthy, living outdoors, um, in the grass, the pastures, with each other, nothing like sad is going down. Pollution kept to like a sheer minimum, if anything. And when I talk to the farmers, they're very open with what they use, what they do, and why they try to farm the way they farm. So I think this is obvious. But farmers are not environmental scientists. They may genuinely believe that they are doing better for the environment because, look, a concentrated fecal lagoon looks gross and on their farms the poop is more spread out. But that's just not how the world works. Looks can often be deceiving, as is the case with these small and inefficient farming operations. The only win-win scenario is to switch out animal foods for plant proteins. Not only does it drastically reduce the amount of animal suffering, but it's also better for the environment and human beings as well. Some people will argue and say, no, it's not ethically because an animal is still being killed so you can eat them. I would argue that, especially as a Christian, um, and this is why I base everything off of the Bible. <laughs> a lot of people will base things off of emotions or just how they feel. And for me, in the Bible, it says that the Lord gave people meat. They gave them the beasts of the field to use. They gave them these animals in order to fuel their bodies. So she says that a lot of people base their beliefs off of emotions or just how they feel. Uh, she's ultimately criticizing subjectivism here, which is pretty common. It's a common attack that Christians level at non-religious people. And it's pretty lazy, honestly. You know, instead of countering rational arguments for veganism or really anything else, it's much easier to just straw man people and say, oh, we're all just emotional. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, that might be true for a sizable number of vegans, but it's pretty low hanging fruit. Many vegans, including myself, are vegan as a result of applying general moral principles consistently. So basically, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you were in the cow or the chicken's place, would you really want your life cut drastically short because someone likes the way you taste? This isn't about how we feel. It's about how we can reason about how the animal feels. We can observe and reason that animals don't like to be harmed. We can consider their idealized interests. They respond to harm by reacting to avoid it and not just like mindlessly like a reflex like many insects, but intelligently and thoughtfully. Animals can think and learn and reason and figure out how to get things they want and avoid things that they fear. The following is from the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness. The absence of a neocortex does not appear to preclude an organism from experiencing affective states. Convergent evidence indicates that non-human animals have the neuroanatomical, neurochemical, and neurophysiological substrates of conscious states along with the capacity to exhibit intentional behaviors. Consequently, the weight of evidence indicates that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness. Non-human animals, including all mammals and birds, and many other creatures, including octopuses, also possess these neurological substrates. Again, it's not about how I feel. It's about respecting the fact that many non-human animals have feelings too. It's not okay to devalue others just because we can, just because they taste good.
The golden rule applies across many, if not all, major world religions, and there is nothing in the Bible that tells you not to use reason. And there is nothing that tells you as a Christian not to be vegan. Not Acts 10.13, and no, not even Romans 14.2. Faith can be an inspiring and motivating force for good, But when people use faith in place of reason, when they use bad scriptural interpretations to justify doing harm to others, it's quickly corrupted into a force for bad instead of a force for good. It's very disappointing to see people like Sarah appealing to their Christian faith, um, using it as an excuse to ultimately kill animals for personal enjoyment rather than for sacrifice or survival as the Bible allows. God permitted killing animals for meat only after the flood, and there are lots of theological theories on that revolving around a more barren world or weakened man. What's most clear is God's ideal, as expressed in the Garden of Eden, is a vegetarian world, and arguably in the kingdom to come after Jesus' return as well. So look, it's her choice to eat meat if she really wants to. The Bible does permit it, just like it permits slavery. But there's nothing in the Bible that excuses either of those actions in the modern era outside of the context of historical need. And there is nothing in the Bible saying animals were created in order to feed man any more than it says that blacks were created to serve whites. If dominion means that you can eat your subject for nothing but the taste of them, then the repeated themes of a good king in Jesus' parables are pretty confusing. Even in the Bible, how many, literally millions of animals were sacrificed because God told his people to do so. Okay, so God said to sacrifice animals for specific reasons, like to remove sin or famously for Passover when God killed all of the Egyptian firstborn children, but sacrifices were offered to protect the Israelite children. This was not merely to eat them because they taste good. This was an issue of metaphysical need from the fall or even avoiding imminent death from the plague. This was not just a want. Now, if you were Jewish and you follow all of the old laws to the letter and you deny the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then sure, an ongoing requirement could arguably be theologically legitimate under such interpretations. But if you were a Christian and you have ever read the Bible, you would know that Jesus cleansed the temple to stop the selling of animal sacrifices. Jesus even said to learn the meaning of, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. It is a repeated theme in the Old and New Testaments. Now, you can interpret that as Jesus just not wanting people to sin in the first place or not liking the exploitative financial aspect of it, but it's pretty hard to ignore the animal ethics component given the sum of his teachings. God doesn't really want people to burn animals. And the fact that most Christians believe that Jesus sacrificed his own life to pay for the sins of mankind, thereby making animal sacrifices no longer necessary, that would be kind of inconsistent with a mere anti-vicarious redemption message. The bottom line is that it is pretty well established consensus among Christian theologians from every major branch that Jesus' sacrifice ended the need for animal sacrifices, and it's very clear that he didn't take it lightly. I don't know if Sarah just doesn't know that or she's bringing this up because she thinks that an obsolete metaphysical need to cleanse the soul of sin to avoid hell is equivalent to just personally liking the taste of meat. I'm having a hard time seeing how those are equal. Again, it's a great thing that she is eating less meat. She's doing so much better than most people. She doesn't have to make excuses. But to dismiss the moral ramifications of that choice by cherry picking biblical scripture, just like people used to do to support slavery, it's intellectually dishonest and it honestly makes Christianity look pretty shitty. Next, I want to talk about what veganism is. Veganism is not just literally a way of life. Veganism is kind of what I would consider a religion. This is something that people base everything off of. Just like me being a Christian, the Bible, and I base everything off of what the Bible says, people base their lives off of just veganism. Veganism is a philosophy and a way of life. It is not a religion. It's not exclusive in the way that religions are. There are Christian vegans, Muslim vegans, Jewish vegans, humanist vegans, atheist vegans, and so on. There aren't any contradictions here. For non-religious vegans, it can often be one of the strongest values that they hold, but to say that anybody is basing everything off of veganism is quite the stretch. Veganism is limited in scope, and there is a lot of good that we can do that goes beyond it. And there are a lot of bad ideas that vegans can promote, can hold on to. I mean, there are antinatalist vegans, there are lots of vegans promoting dangerous dietary advice, there are even bigoted vegans who hate women, Jews, transgender people, etc. 
This has nothing to do with veganism. At its core, veganism is just the idea of reducing harm to animals. It's one of the natural conclusions that are reached by reasoning from many different core moral or even theological principles. Secular effective altruists, whose core is doing the most material good in the world, will often go vegan or promote veganism because it is one of the best ways to reduce harm. But that's not all they are, and they do things completely unrelated to veganism itself. Christians whose core is living the compassion of Christ may also land on vegan as one of many expressions of that, since a compassionate person seeks to avoid harming others. But again, that's not all they are, and they do many other things unrelated to veganism. There's no such thing as, I eat vegan, or I don't own an animal because I'm vegan. I don't buy leather because I'm vegan. It's like, if you claim to be vegan, everything needs to be cruelty free. You cannot eat animals, you cannot be going to zoos, you cannot have a pet. Like, veganism is beyond just, I eat vegan. It's a religion. It covers every part of your life. Food, cosmetics, pets, zoos, these are not every part of your life. Hopefully not. I mean, if they are, that's pretty sad. Veganism relates to the ways in which we harm and use animals. And yes, today in our current society, unfortunately, this is very, very broad, and sometimes it can be very hard to avoid. I mean, look, if you were really against slavery a couple hundred years ago, you would have faced similar challenges, you know, trying to avoid buying goods made by slaves so that you wouldn't be financially supporting their abusers. I don't think that makes abolitionism a religion. I've even had friends, and I still have these friends, and they say they're vegan, which is true in the sense of what they eat is vegan, but my friend owns a cat and a dog, and she does own a leather coat. Being vegan is having nothing to do with bringing animals into your house, into your home, into your diet, into your body. That's not true at all. There are plenty of vegans who have pets as long as it is a rescue. There's not necessarily anything contradictory about that. I have a video on pet ownership here. Obviously, there are implications to pet ownership and treatment, like not buying from a breeder, but just because there are right and wrong ways to do things doesn't mean that vegan is some absolute prohibition on owning pets. Likewise, there are a lot of vegans who have leather, and there's nothing unvegan about holding on to leather that you already had, you know, rather than just getting rid of it. You already bought the product, the damage was already done, there's no sense in wasting it. That certainly doesn't help the animals. So I think if someone is going to say they're a vegan, especially online, which I never have, I've never said I'm a vegan online, but if someone is going to say that they are vegan, they need to really make sure they know what that is and they stick to it. Because honestly, people are out here to get you. So you need to be really, really careful. There are legitimate contradictions that people engage in, and I think that this can be worth talking about. But we can also recognize the world that we live in and understand that a lot of it is just doing the best that you can. Nobody is a perfect anything. The stupid gotcha culture that exists within the online vegan community and really a lot of online communities is a problem and it's, it's really toxic. But ultimately, it's not about that. It's not about us. It's not about the idiots. It's about the animals. Eating more meat to distance yourself from some of the problems online or because you don't like the way that certain vegans behave, okay, but it's ultimately the animals and the environment that suffer the consequences of that. Sarah is pregnant now, and so it's absolutely not a good time to start changing up your diet and, you know, going vegan unless maybe she had access to a dietitian who was well versed in vegan nutrition because those are so easy to find. But I really, really hope that she won't abandon the reducetarian approach. And I really hope that she gives some more thought to this idea of ethically sustainably sourced meat. It's ultimately just a marketing gimmick that makes people feel better about eating meat. Again, I get that going vegan is hard, and I understand that more people are going to be able to do um, less meat than no meat or no animal products. I totally understand that. But there is a difference between saying like, yeah, I eat some meat because it's really hard not to and this is the best I can do, and saying, yeah, I eat some meat and it's actually a good thing to do. I do think that there is a way that you can be good to the environment and not be vegan. Absolutely. Austro vegan, which is vegan plus oysters, particularly sustainably farmed rope grown oysters. These might actually be good for the environment too, 
We're not quite sure. They produce a little bit of methane, but that's from filter feeding. And if they didn't eat the waste, then worms in the sediment might instead. Basically, it's an open question right now. Freegan is also great. That's vegan, plus you eat any food that would have gone to waste. Stuff that people are throwing out can be salvaged from dumpsters or from trays at food courts, etc. Saving food from waste, even meat, can reduce carbon footprint a lot. There's also being an invasivore, where you eat invasive species and help to protect the local environment and other animals from habitat loss. So yeah, there really are legit non-vegan options that have some pretty strong environmental and even ethical arguments behind them. But none of these options involve buying from a farm where land animals are raised and slaughtered for food. I have, again, I have vegan friends and one of my friends loves avocados. She's buying like all these avocados and tropical fruits and vegetables from across the world that Walmart has to go in and grab them all and ship them back here and then she buys them and it's like, doesn't that do a lot more damage to the earth? Like all that transportation and everything versus me buying meat from my local farmer's market? First. If you are replacing meat in your diet with fruit, you are doing it very, very wrong. Meat is a protein. It should be replaced by beans or other plant proteins, not sugar. It's unfair to compare calories of meat to calories of fruits and vegetables. I talked about this more here. Vegetables aren't bad per kilogram, but they come out looking bad per calorie simply because they are low calorie foods. Plant-based proteins from beans are far more efficient than any kind of meat. So when you make proper comparisons, a vegan alternative is always going to win. Many studies by now have come to similar conclusions on the issue. Second, a lot of what Sarah is saying is based on this local war myth. The overwhelming majority of embodied energy in food is actually in the production of that food and its processing, not in the transportation. Transportation is actually pretty efficient. It makes up less than half of the energy investment, and in environmental terms, it is on average only around 11% of the embodied carbon in food. Meanwhile, the same crop grown in different areas could require five or so times the energy due to greenhouse gases, etc., as well as more land and more chemical inputs to achieve less yield. Eating local can very easily make matters worse. It's not even clear local production reduces carbon emissions from transportation. The Harvard economist Ed Glacier estimates that carbon emissions from transportation don't decline in a locavore future because local farms reduce population density as potential homes are displaced by community gardens. Less dense cities mean more driving and more carbon emissions. It absolutely makes sense to buy in season when it comes to perishable produce. And it can make sense to buy local if it is cheaper, just because that often reflects a better yield, assuming that there are no subsidies involved. But when it comes to a legitimate comparison between beans flown around the world versus local meat, the beans still win. I think you could totally be good to the environment and not be vegan. Buying local is huge. Trying to buy seasonal like fruits and vegetables is really huge. And also recycle, thrift shop, reuse, all that stuff is really important. You don't need to be a vegan to do such things. You just need to be a person. Aside from the local stuff, sure, most of that is good but it's just another way to lessen impact. None of it nullifies the contribution of a diet containing significant amounts of animal products. Vegan is the best way to lessen your impact and it absolutely dwarfs small gestures like recycling. Suggesting to do this other stuff and then it's fine, go ahead and eat more meat, it just doesn't make sense. It's pointing out the speck in your friend's eye and ignoring the log in your own. Vegans can absolutely make bad environmental choices in other areas of their lives, and we do need to work on that. But the worst and most common bad environmental choice is the one that people do every day when they opt for animal-based foods. If you are trying to eat more meat, you are objectively going in the wrong direction. Recycling is not going to offset that. Obviously, not everyone can go vegan, and most people struggle to do so. Most people struggle to stick with it. But we can all recognize the areas that we can improve on, do our best to improve on them, and above all, try to avoid going backwards. Last thing I want to talk about, one of the main things that people were telling me was like, humans are animals, animals are humans, like we're all on the same level. Veganism is just about reducing harm. It has nothing to do with placing humans and animals on the same level. It doesn't say that they're not on the same level or that they are. It doesn't do anything like 
ranking, right? I mean, like I said before, it's not a religion. It doesn't speak at all to those underlying philosophical foundations that you might have that lead you to veganism. And any vegans who are really saying that, that they're really saying that all animals and all humans have equal moral value, they are not practicing what they preach. I know of no vegans who aren't killing animals all the time just by being alive, just going for a walk you are stepping on insects. If you really valued those worms, beetles, etc., as much as you value your dog, your husband, your parents, your children, you would be absolutely devastated every moment of your life. Nobody really believes that worms are equal to people. And I really don't believe that as a Christian, but say I do, say we are all on the same level. I'm just as important as that cow and that whale, those cute little bunny rabbits. Then why are so many people in the vegan community so just set on animals? Why aren't you guys set also on humans as well? Most vegans are. Most vegans are pretty progressive. They are interested in helping the poor and helping the oppressed. And there are Christian vegans too. Again, nothing in veganism says that you have to equally value humans and animals. You basically just need to care enough and believe that animals have just enough value that for whatever reason, it's worth it to do less harm to them. My vegan friends will all go shopping at H&M and Forever 21 and it's like, well, did you know that those are sweatshops? Did you know that women are raped and people are killed in these sweatshops? Do you understand the living conditions? Do you understand the fear these workers have for their lives? All the people in the vegan community are just so wrapped around like save the animals, all this stuff and then they do things like that. Actually, a lot of vegans do have problems with sweatshops, and while I can't speak to your friends' reasons, there are actually good reasons not to boycott sweatshop-produced goods. The conditions in these sweatshops are often terrible, but they are also often the best jobs available in many regions. So when you analyze any moral situation, it's really important to look at what will happen if you don't support something. So when we don't support animal agriculture and we buy plant-based proteins instead, farmers breed fewer animals and the massively overpopulated species is reduced a little. Some land can be returned to forest or other uses and less greenhouse gases are produced. This slows global warming and saves human lives too. A few jobs in slaughterhouses are lost, but the farmers grow more beans and more jobs are created in producing those plant-based proteins. From our support, the market grows and innovates promoting more positive change. These are good outcomes. Now, when we don't support sweatshops, these companies close shop or move to other regions where people already have good jobs and the market is more competitive, so it doesn't really help the people there as much. But the closed sweatshop means that people who relied on that shitty job now have no job or have to do an even shittier job. Sometimes they have to turn to prostitution or they have to take their kids out of school and go to the mines or other dirtier, more dangerous, lower paying work. These are bad outcomes. Should we try to improve conditions in these areas? Absolutely, but that's not something that we can achieve by boycotting and thereby forcing these jobs into more developed areas. Instead, we need to promote economic development and rule of law, and a lot of that comes from trading with them and supporting jobs there. I have a huge issue with that whale that miscarried her whale, and everyone's freaking out about it, and no one is talking about how 150,000 babies are aborted every single day from the womb of their mother. Don't you think that's wrong? Plenty of vegans are anti-abortion, including non-religious vegans who are concerned about fetal suffering during the third trimester. However, many people do not believe that the fetus in itself has any value, particularly early on in the pregnancy, when the fetus is not sentient yet. At this point, there's really just concern for the mother. It's not really fair for people like Sarah to condemn vegans as hypocrites for disagreeing with her when the issue of abortion has more to do with theology than veganism, and vegans are divided on it. You can be vegan regardless of what you believe about abortion. People are so, so important. Think about it, like child slavery, kids dying from freaking starvation for crying out loud, and you're just trying to save a cow? One of the main drivers of starvation today is global warming caused by our overconsumption. Shifting climate patterns affect agriculture in less developed countries that don't have our more advanced irrigation technology. The effects of heat waves and natural disasters are magnified etc. Now, a large part of that climate change is animal agriculture, including what Sarah supports. She may not really care about the cow, but if she cares about the starving child, there is a good reason not to eat the cow. There is a good reason to refrain from supporting the industry that are doing 
the most harm to humankind by way of environmental harm. Vegans are not choosing animals over humans. Leaving animal agriculture in the past as the inefficient, environmentally destructive industry that it is, is a win-win for humanity. So that's really it as far as the video goes. Um, I've said before that I don't like responding to these sorts of videos, these why I'm not vegan um, videos, but I wanted to in this case, again, not to make Sarah feel bad or anything like that. A lot of her reasoning is just bad, and she says a lot of things that a lot of non-vegans often say, criticisms that non-vegans often make of vegans and veganism, so I thought this was kind of a good uh, easy way, I guess, to, to tackle all of those. I don't know. I know there's a lot, I know there's a lot going on in this video, so I hope you enjoyed it. Comments, questions, that kind of stuff. Subscribe, support the channel, patreon.com slash unnaturalvegan, and I will have a new video very soon. Is it really octopuses? <laughs> Wait, it's not octopi? Oh my god. Although it is often supposed that octopi is the correct plural of octopus, and it has been in use for longer than the usual anglicized plural octopuses, it in fact originates as an error. Well, you learn something every day. Shout out to that weird Rugrats episode. <laughs> for many of you, including myself, that was probably your first like introduction to Passover and uh, seemed really inappropriate for a kid's show.